Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show, your home for open, honest, and provocative conversations. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Hours after President Biden vowed to make Russia pay for its attacks on Ukraine, there is little evidence that Vladimir Putin is ready to retreat. Instead, the president of Ukraine offered this grim warning overnight. They have an order to erase our history, erase our country, erase us all. Even before the war began last week, there was a lot riding on President Biden's speech. Democrats were hoping for a reset of the party's message um, because they have midterms facing them down in November, uh, apparently hoping that Americans might forget about the mask and the vaccine mandates to the calls to defund the police departments around the country, to what's happening down at the southern border, and so on. Um, How'd that go? Hmm, We'll get it discussed in a second. Uh, Now, they wanted to pivot toward unity, right? Unity. Remember Biden's calls for unity in his inaugural address last year and right after he won last year? And then, of course, there was the way he actually governed since that point. Here's a reminder. Without unity, there is no peace only bitterness and fury, no progress, only exhausting outrage. Do you want to be the on the side of Dr. King or George Wallace? Do you want to be in the side of John Lewis or Bull Connor? Do you want to be in the side of Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis? This is the moment to decide. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin. And your refusal has cost all of us. Let's stop sending each, seeing each other as enemies and start seeing each other for who we are, fellow Americans. So he he doesn't talk to the American people writ large the same way he does when he is not on a big stage, right, for things like the State of the Union. And I think the American people know that. Look, joining me to break it all down for us, all angles on the State of the Union, we have Charles C.W. Cook with us today, senior writer at National Review. And Jeremy Peters joins the program for the first time, national political reporter for The New York Times and author of the new book, Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and got everything they ever wanted. It's a clever title. Uh, welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, Charles. So let me start with you, uh, because I know you have a, a piece up on National Review this morning, which everybody should read. It's called All the President's Incoherence. Your thoughts on how he did? I thought it was an unmitigated disaster. Now, I'm not perhaps the target audience, as you and your listeners know, I don't rate this president. But even on his own terms, I thought it was misconceived. The first 10 minutes on Ukraine were fine. But after that, he didn't do any of the things that we were told he would do. Uh, He was supposed to reset. Well, he didn't. Uh, He was supposed to shift to deficit reduction away from Build Back Better in an attempt to win over Senator Manchin. He didn't. He reiterated the entire Build Back Better agenda without saying those three words. Uh, He contradicted himself. He introduced topics at random. I I likened it in the piece to David Bowie, who used to write down random lyrics on a piece of paper, cut them up, throw them up in the air, and then reassemble them. That's how it sounded. And then there's the question of his delivery, uh, which is getting worse and worse. You know, people say that it's because he had a stutter when he was a child. It's not. I've been watching Joe Biden for years. He wasn't like this 10 years ago. He does seem old. He seems incoherent. He slurs his words. He reads the wrong words. I I didn't think this worked for him at all. Hmm. Jeremy, what, what do you make of it? What do you think? I think it was the message that you would expect from the leader of a party that doesn't really have a coherent message to unify voters around going into uh, this next midterm election and, and possibly even into 2024. It was a string of very vague utopian promises. Uh, We're we're going to end expensive prescription drugs. We're going to end expensive housing. Uh, We're going to end all inequality. We're going to end poverty. We're going to end misery, period. And it seemed that, that all of those promises the president really couldn't back up with any specifics. I mean, it it was it struck me how vague 
many of his lines were. And I think that while there probably were some appeals there that he made to the center, you know, there, there was a line he had where he said, we're not going to defund the police, we should fund the police. I think the perceptions of this administration as captive to the far left are really problematic, even if those the, that's often exaggerated. I think that the hardest thing that the Democrats are going to have to contend with over the next few months is, is a version of what we saw unfolding in Texas last night and with the primaries uh, in the southern part of the state, where you have a progressive and a moderate who are headed off into a very contentious runoff. And if that progressive ends up winning, um, it's going going to really make it hard for the party to say that it's it's representative of most Americans and not a, a far left entity. Mm-hmm. I want to get to that defund the police thing in one second. But, you know, to your point of this, you know, wish list, this democratic utopia, all I could think while watching it was, OK, so he's throwing out these huge things. You know, we're, again, we're going to cure cancer and we're going to have all sorts of provisions for Democrats that they've been asking him for. And I thought, all right, well, in 2022, I, I would like to to have the body of Giselle and the skin of J-Lo and the energy of a 12-year-old along with the metabolism. Those are my goals for myself. They're just about as attainable as his goals. And the thing about Joe Biden's list, Charles, is that it was sort of he wanted to have it both ways on so many things, right? Like Build Back yeah. Better is gone, but I'm bringing it back in pieces. I'm going to do something about inflation, but here are all these huge things, these spending measures, which, by the way, I know I cannot get through, but they're going to make you feel good as you go to sleep tonight. Neither party at the moment is especially coherent. Uh, and I, when I say that, I don't just mean that both parties have broad coalitions full of people who disagree with one another, although that is true. I I mean that their stated policy aims are often incoherent. Uh, But it was remarkable last night to hear incoherence from one person, the President of the United States. There were two moments that jumped out to me. The first was that Biden tried his folksy shtick about how he understands the effects of inflation. He knows what it does. He understands why people are so angry. And almost in the next sentence, he touted uh, the two trillion dollars in spending that his party rushed through last March, which is responsible for exacerbating inflation on a grand scale. Pick one. Uh, The second thing he did was focus in on what is really a a more Trumpian line, uh, which is make it in America, build it in America. Now, that's actually quite popular. And the reason he's doing that is that he has found out from focus groups that when Democrats talk about inflation, people don't really buy the idea that it's because we have greedy corporations, but they do buy, erroneously, because this is economic nonsense, the idea that we can fight inflation by bringing manufacturing back to the United States. So he went all in on that. But then he proposed a whole litany of ideas that would make it much more difficult to bring manufacturing back to the United States by making us less competitive, uh, by making labor more expensive, uh, and by making capital uh, likely to flee. Um, Again, pick one. Um, so, you know, in a sense, this was this was a president who was trying to push buttons and, and work around uh, the, the the public's distaste for him, but doing so in, in no thought through way at all. I think uh, in reading opinion pieces from the left and the right this morning, most people are agreed that in agreement that the best part was on Ukraine, the, where he kicked it off at the top. And they, they had a real moment of unity where both sides stood and and, you know, clap for what he was saying. Here's just a little bit of that. That This is soundbite two. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. Our forces are not engaged and will not engage in the conflict with Russian forces in Ukraine. The United States and our allies will defend every inch of territory that is NATO territory with the full force of our collective power. Every single inch. 
What did you make of that, Jeremy? Because I, I, one point somebody made was great. He's rolling along strong. He's got everybody standing. And then it just sort of pivoted to something that was more like, a, like you said, a wish list or sort of a college discussion. It's just like a couple minutes later, we're, we're talking about such small minutia after this big moment. One pundit was suggesting shorter, less, pick your top three points, get in, get out, sit down. Right. Well, that, Megan, is the problem with the speech overall. There was nothing unifying it. And I think right there uh, you have a perfect example of the way that Democrats have struggled to connect with voters. OK, so uh, on, on the surface, he's saying the right things. Yes, the Ukrainian people are standing up. The United States is behind you, Ukraine. However, there was no concrete action to back that up. And there, I think people are kind of left with the question, OK, that's great. It's nice rhetoric. But what are you going to do? And I'm not saying that I think there is a whole lot like militarily the United States should be or could be doing uh, right now that wouldn't drag us into a full on military conflict with Russia. But it's an example of the way that I think the, the Democratic Party has has struggled to effectively speak to people's concerns and anxieties. And this is why the Republicans and Donald Trump have been making really big inroads with a lot of voters who wouldn't ordinarily think about voting Republicans. Re- Republicans right now are just better at, at channeling the anxieties, the fears of voters out there and giving them a sense that that they understand, to borrow a, a cliched phrase here, the voters pain. Mm-hmm. They, 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 there's, a, there's an empathy there that is, is much more concrete that I think works for you know everybody from uh, Donald Trump on on down who is is speaking to this notion that there are Americans who feel like their government isn't doing much to help them in in what are are, are pretty depressing and, and and trying times for a lot of people. He so, tried. He tried to do to do the Joe Biden folksy. We've heard him do it a million times, Jeremy. Right? I get it. I get it. You know the increased prices, the inflation. Trust me, I get it. But. There wasn't a lot that followed to make you actually believe he gets it. I think that's exactly right. There, like, like we said, he was very short on specifics of how he would address it. But then when I listened to Kim Reynolds' speech, who delivered the Republican response, there was a, a real fire there. Like, she, you know, she was speaking to a lot of the, the concerns that voters have that their elected officials aren't representing them, that they aren't listening to them. As uh, one Democratic strategist I spoke to before the speech said, like, you know, the, the Republicans understand that parents, for example, example, don't want to hear that school boards don't want them involved in their children's education. Mm-hmm. And you know, regardless of the specifics of, of any particular debate in any given school district, th- that's true. Parents don't want to be told uh, to, to shut up and sit down, just like average voters uh, on, on any number of concerns don't want to be told, oh, well, this, the, w- what you're worried about isn't isn't really a big deal. Um, so, let, you know, let, let's let's move on. And I think the Democratic Party's problem and, and what Biden's lack of specifics last night you know, really points to is the, the struggle that Democrats have had in acknowledging people's problems, whether that's inflation, whether that's crime, um, whether that's what the curriculum that's being taught in schools. They have a, a, a denial problem and mm-hmm. they as, until they learn to speak to the concerns that not just, you know, Republican or even centrist voters have, but that like many Democratic voters, many Democratic parents have, they're going to come up short. I mean, Charles, it makes me wonder whether it's good old fashioned shame, but most politicians don't feel that. But, you know, the old you can't uh, kill your parents and then beg for mercy on the ground that you're an orphan. Like, do you is there any chance Joe Biden's not touting those things and not speaking about his understanding of the working class? Because he knows very well that his exorbitant spending has helped put them in the position they're in now, not to mention, you know, these covid mandates that have resulted in the loss of so many of their jobs and so on and so forth. No, I don't it's think not so. it. Shame. I, I don't think he knows. He still seems to think Afghanistan was a success. He didn't mention it at all last night. Maybe his speechwriters know. I don't think that this is a man who is feeling shame. No, he may be feeling frustrated. He may also be feeling, and this is true in certain ways, that much of what is going on is not his fault. But I think he strongly believes in everything that he pushed again last night. I think that uh, was Joe Biden. I don't think this is a ruse. 
I don't think this is a calculation, some 8D chess. Mm-hmm. I think that is Joe Biden. And the cancer thing you mentioned earlier is a good illustration of this. The way that Joe Biden talks about cancer uh, is indicative of somebody who has spent his whole life in politics. Obviously, everyone wants to fight and defeat cancer. But Joe Biden seems at one level to believe that if the government gets more involved, we'll do it, that we haven't done this thus far because the government hasn't been sufficiently supportive. And that's not why we haven't defeated cancer. And that, as far as I can see, is his view on pretty much everything. What he is interested in doing tends to change because he likes to keep himself at the center of the Democratic Party at any given point. This is one reason he's moved so far left, because the Democratic Party has. Joe Biden is not a man who spends a great deal of time thinking about ideology or policy. He moves with the wind, uh, at least the wind as it is defined by the Democratic Party. So what he wants to do alters over time. But his constant is that government is good and that Democrats running the government uh, is good for the little guy. And the problem he has at the moment is that Democrats running the government is not especially good for the little guy. Now, again, I don't think that all of the problems that Americans are facing are Joe Biden's fault or the Democratic Party's fault or, frankly, the government's fault. Uh, I do think, though, that he can't get out of that mindset. And so what did he do last night? He made a speech about how every single thing that is currently wrong or every single thing that is currently motivating the members of his party and his coalition could be fixed if the government came in uh, and did it, even though there is almost no chance of the government coming in and doing pretty much anything he right, proposed. Right. He's already tried that and he doesn't have the support for most of these policies amongst his own party, never mind if you factor Republicans into it. Uh, w- one point and then, well, two points, and I'd love to get your reaction, Jeremy. First, I personally thought it was not a good idea to yet again raise his son Bo's death at the same time that he was totally ignoring the death of the 13 service members uh, in pulling out of Afghanistan. It just don't, if you're not going to go there, if you're not going to touch Afghanistan, you're not going to touch on, you know, the 13 dead Marines and service personnel, then don't raise your own son's death. You know, Charles has talked about this before. It's just too much. It's too insensitive. And the loss of those 13 families is still too recent. Um, but the second point I wanted to make was brought more broadly on Ukraine. I actually thought he had more room that he, for, for, touting what he's done. I was surprised he didn't spend more time on it. Um, this, just this morning, I listened to The Daily, the, the New York Times podcast with Michael Barbaro, which I always try to do. And it's interesting. I like to get my information from both sides of the aisle. And today they had a great report um, about what actually Joe Biden had been doing months prior to right now to try to generate unity amongst the Europeans against Putin. And that was the subject of the podcast. It was about how the Europeans came together. And they didn't give Joe Biden all the credit, but they talked about how he had been going to the Europeans and sharing the American intel and saying, no, this is what's going to happen. You need to take a hard look at this and really sold it personally for them to believe it. And it was a great story about how there's this other guy who wears like sneakers and bad suits, uh, who is in the European U- Union, who everybody sort of mocks normally. But this one little guy who understood the importance and value of U.S. intelligence went country to country within the EU trying to convince various factions, we got to do something, we got to do something. And that's why they were able to act so quickly on the sanctions. And it was a great piece. Didn't hear any of that. Oh, I hear that in the daily and not the State of the Union. I think it speaks to the larger problem that this administration has had with talking about the right things. They seem to constantly be on the subject, on the wrong subject, really. I mean, and, and this is not just uh, uh, something that I hear Republicans and uh, conservatives criticizing this president for. It's something I hear Democrats talking a lot about, too, is that one of the things that voters will punish you for undoubtedly, is that if they believe you are not on the right subject, if you are not connect, connecting with what is important to them in, in that moment. And when America was concerned about, uh, you know, the, the, the coronavirus restrictions uh, and Afghanistan, Democrats were busy fighting each other over this infrastructure bill. You know, I mean, that's a perfect example. And you know, right now, uh, when the world's attention and America's attention is focused on this, this conflict in, in Eastern Europe, um, the president isn't really talking about why uh, they should care, why they should, uh, why they should, frankly, um, 
look to what his administration is, as has done and be proud of that. And, and I think that's what you're identifying there. It's just it's, it's an inability to talk about the right things. And if that doesn't change, if the kind of lack of, of a coherent message that we saw last night in the State of the Union isn't fixed, it, I don't see how Democrats are going to be able to communicate with the country in a way that puts them back in the same place where they were two years ago, which is so we are the true. party that can restore normalcy and competence to the government. It's so true. Talk about missed opportunity. It's like I learned all about the beams that go in certain buildings, but I didn't learn any of this stuff that actually would have been unifying, would have instilled some patriotic feelings and as a result, some good feelings about him. But nope. Um, we You mentioned it, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, a second ago, the defund the police thing. I don't believe the solution is to defund the police. We should fund the police. OK, well, <laughs> that is. That is not representative of a huge faction of his party, and and it's not in touch with what we saw happen over the past two years in this country to the great consternation of many black, white, Democrat, Republican. Uh, we're going to play that moment, uh, what, Joe, what Joe Biden said and what the Democrats around him have been saying prior to this when we come back after a very quick break. Don't go away. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-owned coffee company serving premium coffee to people who love America. They develop their explosive roast profiles with the same mission focus they learned as military members serving this great country. And they are committed to supporting veterans, law enforcement, and first responders. With every purchase you make, they give back. Black Rifle Coffee imports high-quality coffee beans from Colombia and Brazil, and they roast them five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee, and Salt Lake City, Utah. The best way to enjoy their freedom-filled coffee is with the Black Rifle Coffee Club. When you join the club, your chosen brew is roasted, packaged, and shipped free to your door on your schedule. If you're on the go, grab an 11-ounce ready-to-drink espresso mocha and fuel your mission. Black Rifle Coffee delivers fresh roasted coffee from around the world to your doorstep. You can buy it at BlackRifleCoffee.com and use the code MK at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. All right, guys. Um, so let's talk about this defund the police moment. To listen to Joe Biden last night, you you would have thought there's absolutely zero daylight between Joe Biden and even Donald Trump on the issue of defunding the cops. Here's what uh, the president said last night. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. It's to fund the police. Fund them. Fund them. Fund them with resources and training. Resources and training they need to protect our communities. Look at look Kamala Harris on her feet. Kamala Harris, who's been pretty explicit on the other side. Um, But forget them, because the Democrat Party, the Democratic Party has so many representatives who have been pushing for this and who got it over the past couple of years, resulting in disaster after disaster in cities like Minneapolis. We put together just a short uh, list of examples. Here they are. Suck it up. Defunding the police has to happen. We need to defund the police. Mayor Eric Garcetti saying, take some of the money from policing, about $150 million. I applaud Eric Garcetti for doing what he's done. Not only do we need to disinvest for in police, but we need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. So yes, defund your butts. Defund you. Yes, I support the reallocation of resources. Uh, from NYPD. We will be moving funding from the NYPD to youth initiatives and social services. They are talking about reducing uh, the allocation of resources to that department. And I think every single city in this country ought to be thinking about the same thing. Yes, I support the defund movement. I'm for responsible reallocation of resources. And defund the police. I think you do all those other things. You don't need all the money that's going to the police department. So, yeah, I mean, the spirit of it, I, I, I do support that. OK, so, Charles, he can stand at the top and, you know, stand at the lectern 
all day long and say he's against defunding the police. But the American people have a memory and we've seen it tried in city after city. And we've heard those Democrats very publicly calling for it. Um, and it's been a disaster. That plus the soft on crime DAs have, has led to real crime problems in many cities. So what do you make of it? I think there's two things to say here. The first is it would be churlish not to applaud Biden for taking this position. What the purpose of politics is to convince people that you're right and they're wrong. Now Biden has never been uh, a defund the police guy, but it should be seen as a victory for those who are against this idea that he felt the need to stand up there. You know, this is something Jonah Goldberg always points out. What you actually want is for the other side to adopt all your ideas. Uh, because then you don't have to fight very hard. Uh, and the fact that Joe Biden said this does signal uh, a shift. Um, and it is a good thing that he's not on, on board with this. So uh, I would certainly give him that. The political problem for him, as you say, is that he's still taking a defensive action there. He felt the need to say it because his party, not all of them, but uh, certainly the most vocal elements, have created this hostage Bill Clinton did not say fund the police. George W. Bush did not say fund the police. Barack Obama did not say fund the police. Why? Because they had nothing to respond to. Certainly there have been criticisms of the police, some of which are warranted. But this movement uh, is something of a weight around Biden's neck. And so although I applaud him for saying it, he probably didn't want to have to. This is not a good thing for him to have to respond to. Uh, and that it is still out there is going to hurt uh, his party going forward, especially, I suspect, um, in the sort of moderate suburban seats that uh, he's going to need uh, in 2022 and if he runs for re-election in 2024. You know, Jeremy, it's uh, defund the police is an explicit piece of the Black Lives Matter platform. Uh, it's on their website. They've made no uh, mystery about it. And of so many Democrats, as we just played. And there was a bizarre tweet um, by Eli Mistal uh, of The Nation uh, in response to this quote. He writes, we don't need to defund the police. We need to fund them. He's quoting Joe Biden uh, with resources and training. And then he responds, what freaking bullocks. But it's what whites want to hear. Now, the truth is, it's not just whites who want to hear that. It's actually black voters, even more than white voters, who right. have pushed this reversal. And if you look back um, at the history of what they did in Minneapolis and what they did in Detroit and so on, all, the, all these other cities that fell victim to the defund the police pushers, um, it was black voters who were objecting the loudest. Uh, in, in Minneapolis, three quarters of Minneapolis black voters were against defund the police. And in fact, what they said there was, well, what about just having a Department of Public Safety where we reimagine the police department? And they were like, not only no, but hell no. No, we don't want that. Blacks more than whites saw the same thing in Detroit. So while people will try to racialize this, you know, the push to fund the police as opposed to defund them, the, the truth is the facts belie that claim. Mm -hmm. It's it's not only untrue that that's what whites exclusively want to hear um it, it, it and and that blacks don't want to hear that um neither do hispanics if you look at what happened in southern texas in the 2020 congressional races a lot of the backlash to the democratic party there was because of the heavy law enforcement presence a lot of the people who live down there are in the border patrol or they are in um some type of law enforcement uh, that they rely on for their family's survival and they don't like to hear defund the police slogans, um, you know, any more uh, than than people who live in high crime areas do. Uh, and I think that, you know, I actually want to point out, Megan, that the, while there are loud voices in the Democratic Party that, you know, you, you played the majority, vast majority of Democratic voters and people who are, are liberal and even the vast majority of the Democrats in Congress don't support this. The problem is they just haven't pushed back when the loudest voices call for defunding the police. Well, and, and the second the second problem is that it's actually been happening. You know, I mean, I lived in New York City. One of the final straws in in our relationship between Manhattan and our family was when de Blasio said he was going to defund the police by a hundred million dollars. It was like a peace out. Right. And so it actually it's not just the rhetoric of people like Cori Bush or Rashida Tlaib. It's actually been happening in major blue cities. 
Yeah, and but, but voters have also rejected it. Like the overwhelmingly yeah. liberal Democratic voters of Minneapolis rejected, uh, yes. you know, uh, the Department of Public Safety proposal that you were talking about. And in New York City now, the new mayor, a former cop, has 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 uh, very wisely shifted away from that kind of talk. Um, it's, it's talking about how we need to have a better relationship with, with our police forces. And he didn't change in his proposed budget this year, didn't didn't touch police funding, which um, is, is, you know, basically a, a repudiation of what the people under uh, the, in the de Blasio era uh, were calling for from the city council on up. So, yeah, I think there is a, a much bigger recognition now that that Democrats need to learn how to how to respond when the ideas of a, a, a relative minority of people in their in their party um, have no constituency. I mean, there is no constituency for defund the police. It's 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 a it's a tiny uh, uh, fringe movement. So, but it gets outsized attention, um, and 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 Democrats have struggled with how to deal with that. I think you know one of the things that I, we saw play out in the 2020 elections, and I, you know I get into this in my book is the way that Democrats struggled to even say things that were complimentary about law enforcement. I, I talk about this race in Iowa where the, the the Republicans started doing polling, asking people, OK, do you agree with the statement? Are there a few are cops mostly good people, but there are a few bad apples who need to be thrown out? Or do you believe that, that the policing in the United States is, is, is systemically broken and we need to start from scratch? And overwhelmingly, they agreed with the former that there are a few bad apples, but that most cops are good people. But Democrats never figured out how to ex- express that. And they're still struggling with how to do that. Mm-hmm. Charles, th- th- this sort of speaks to a wider point of some of the items that Joe Biden was hitting last night. So, OK, defund the police is not the right move. It's fund the police without any acknowledgement of how that became an issue and why it's on the mind of so many Americans who have lost their safety in part because of these policies. Right. Um, illegal immigration. He talked about how we need to secure the border. Right. Well, <laughs> the American people know very well that he's implemented a whole host of policies that have, let's, uh, I think it's fair to say, loosened the border as opposed to securing it. And they know that's on him. And he ticked off some small things. We have new technology like scanners to detect better drug smuggling. OK, joint patrols with Mexico and Guatemala. All right. But we're not we're missing sort of the big policies that, for example, President Trump put in place that did make a dent, didn't solve it, but did make a dent. And then the big the mother of all of those was covid. Right. Like covid. Things are getting better and we're going to take the masks off and we're you know, well, I'll you don't have to listen to me say it. Here's Joe Biden saying it. I think it's soundbite three. So stop looking at covid as a partisan dividing line. See it for what it is. A god-awful disease. Tonight I can say we're moving forward safely, back to a no, norm, more normal routines. And our schools are open. Let's keep it that way. Our kids need to be in school. Under the new guidelines, most Americans and most of the country can now go mask-free. And based on projections, and thanks to the progress we've made in the past year, COVID-19 no longer need control our lives. So how did how did all of that happen to us? How did the schools stay closed when they should have been open? How did COVID become such a partisan dividing line? Could it have been all the rhetoric demonizing people who had already had COVID but didn't want to get a vaccine, medical workers, et cetera? I'll let you take it from there. Uh, I, I think, Megan, you're you're failing to relate to your audience. The extraordinary good fortune that Joe Biden has benefited from in that the science changed one day before his State (laughs) of the Union. No one could have seen that coming. There's two years worth of tests. And and it just so happened that March 1st, 2022 is a cutoff point. Mm -hmm. I found this very, very annoying as a Floridian uh, to be lectured about political divisions on COVID by President Biden and his party. Because here, as I've said to you before, everyone that uh, I know did not initially see this as a political question. Uh, And it was quickly turned into one. And certain states and approaches and governors were vilified nationally, including by President Biden. And for him to, uh, to, to talk in that saccharine way 
uh, I, I think is is un, unreasonable. Um, I think more broadly, the three issues you mentioned shows that the Democrats can also suffer from having so much cultural power. There are a lot of ways in which the Democratic Party benefits from its prominence in the media, in academia, and entertainment. But sometimes it can become captured by those institutions, and it can have fringe messages um, or elite messages amplified uh, to its detriment. And it seems to me that the, the defund the police case, uh, that Jeremy is right when he says this is not uh, held as a value by the vast majority of Democratic voters, but it is popular uh, among wealthier, more heavily educated, uh, and more nationally influential types. And so it was pushed out there. It was, it was promulgated um, across the entertainment world, across the media world, across the academic world. Uh, you have, therefore, a Democratic Party whose reputation on questions such as defund the police, enforce the border, uh, and our COVID rules is hostage to a, a smaller group, but, but a more influential group. Um, than the party represents at large. And, and I think, for once, Democrats are really suffering from this because you know, if you talk to sort of rank-and-file Democrats across this country, they do not sound like the New York Times editorial page or the Washington Post editorial page on the question of COVID. They don't sound like the faculty uh, at Harvard. Um, but a lot of those people are really struggling to, to give this up. Uh, and uh, until they do, uh, things even uh, that Biden is not responsible for um, are going to continue to uh, weigh him down. Mm. That's very true. I mean, it does seem like Joe Biden couldn't really have a spike the ball in the end zone moment, just given the past behavior and messaging from the administration. Um, but also because there's a strong piece of his base that is still mm -hmm. very afraid of covid jeremy i mean speaking of the daily they did a deep dive into this uh with david leonhardt not long ago on how there's it's become so partisan that like the hardcore left is just definitely not willing to let go of covid and that's one of his challenges in declaring victory and sort of trying to clear a path between now and november for we beat it. Forget those two years in the masks and the mask mandates and or the vax mandates and so on. Right. And this is a perfect example of, you know, I, I most of my colleagues, the vast, vast, vast majority of my colleagues in the media are, are not the kind of people who are making things up. They're not purveyors of fake news. They're, they're good, decent, hardworking, honest journalists. But the problem with the way that a lot of the media portrays these issues is, is perfectly emblematic of this larger struggle with the Democratic Party in that they are talking and, and, and promoting the ideas that only a, a relative small elite is talking about on social media. And there's a huge difference between the conversation that is happening on social media among progressives and many in the media and what voters are saying back at home. Defund that the police is, so is a true. perfect example of that. Um, and so is is COVID, right? I think the majority of the country, um, you know, has as if not moved on, is ready to deal with ready to live with COVID live in with a it. way that does not restrict them. And if you look at even in New York City, like I, I live in New York City, I was walking down the sidewalk the other day and I heard a woman on her cell phone saying, thank God this, you know, the masks will be over. And there are people who have, you know, I know there's a, this, this, this cliche that New York, everybody is, is, is like super liberal and um, COVID phobic, but people have been done with masks outside here for a really long time. And you have seen, you don't see people wearing them as much, nearly as much as you used to. And if you're seeing that in New York City, that's an example of, I think, how people have just, the, the, the leaders of the Democratic Party in a lot of ways, and many progressives are just out of step with how people want to live their lives and what they're worried about right now. To your point about the media not getting, you know, what really is on the mind of the voters, uh, I think it was CBS. But yesterday they did a story on how the war in Ukraine is going to affect one particular transgender person because, you know, the Russians aren't so pro transgender issue. Like, um, talk about like a day 
200 story running on day six. Like, okay, we can get to that. Changes in Ukraine once Russia takes over, if they take over, we could get there. But right now there's actual still fighting in the street and the Ukrainians still believe they might actually pull this out and the international community is rallying behind them. And that is really the story. I don't think people are really focused on the one in any event. Okay, let me pause there. I'll do another break and come back. I got to ask you about the weirdest moment with Nancy Pelosi and the closed fist clapping about the fire pits. I don't know what was going on there, but we have to talk about that and about... You know, Biden and his many gaffes that just continue to surface and what we should be taking from that. Uh, More with Charles and Jeremy and more on Jeremy's book coming up. Uh, Also, remember that you can find The Megyn Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. If you prefer an audio podcast, go ahead and subscribe and download on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts for free. And there you will find our full archives with more than 270 shows. Not bad. We've only really been on the air for about a year and a half, so not bad. How many of you have been thinking about a backyard makeover? Do you wish you had room for a pool? Do your kids wish? You are going to love this idea and your family and friends and kids especially will too. Get a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. A Michael Phelps Swim Spa combines the benefits of a pool with the therapy of a hot tub. It comes in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard, large or small, even if it's a tiny backyard. Michael Phelps Swim Spas by Master Spas have a water current, you see, so you can swim. It's like you're doing laps, but you don't need an Olympic-sized pool to do them. You can do aquatic exercises. You can have fun with your kids. This will reinvent your family time. It's going to be super fun. Novelty, novelty. The water buoyancy will relieve pressure on aching joints, and you can enjoy pure relaxation in the massage therapy seats of the swim spa. And since it's heated, you can use it year-round in any climate. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are 100% made in the USA by Master Spas, the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. You will love yours. Get a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. And Master Spas has a special offer going on right now. You go to masterspas.com, you put in promo code MK, and you save $1,000 on a Michael Phelps Swim Spa or $500 on a Master Spas hot tub. You will not be glad you did. You will not be sad you did. (laughs) You will be sad and not glad if you miss it masterspas.com promo code mk welcome back to the megan kelly show back with me now charles cw cook of national review and the new york times is jeremy peters who is the author of a brand new book called insurgency how republicans lost their party and got everything they ever wanted let's start with that jeremy what does that mean Mm. Okay, so I don't think you can tell the story of the modern Republican Party and Donald Trump's rise without acknowledging that this wasn't a hostile takeover. Trump didn't come in and displace uh, everybody uh, and 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 take command of the party. Um, it was a partnership in a lot of ways. And what many establishment Republicans agreed to take with the bad that came along with Donald Trump was a lot of the good that they saw from a policy perspective. And that's why, you know, when you ask many Republicans uh, from, you know, social conservative anti-abortion activist types um, who I spoke a lot to um, for this book, to folks who are, you know, more establishment minded, um, who were part of the Bush wing of the party, they're fine. Well, maybe not fine, but they are willing to say that January 6th wasn't all that big on the, of, of, an, of an issue as far as they were concerned. They could look past it because Donald Trump delivered the Supreme Court for them. And the Supreme Court is about ready to strike down Roe v. Wade, we think. So you know, that's just one example. But if you look at the types of Republican policy that that uh were pushed that was pushed through during Trump's presidency, a lot of it was very conventional Republican fare. A lot of it, of course, on trade and immigration was not. But the establishment of the Republican Party went along with Trump at first reluctantly, but then willingly because they saw it was a good deal for them. And ultimately, that is is Donald Trump's transactional style of politics. And he infused the party with that in a way that I think surprised a lot of folks. Well, Charles, you're you're a good person to respond to that, because I know you're not a Donald Trump fan. Our audience knows that about you. Um, 
But on the policies, I would imagine you're much happier with how Trump governed than with the presidents who preceded and or came after him. Well, and, and with how I thought a President Trump would govern. Uh, Jeremy's absolutely right to say a lot of what came out of the Trump years was pretty standard Republican fare. The one thing he got done through Congress was a tax cut. Well, there you go. Uh, he tried to get Obamacare repealed. And in fact, it wasn't for uh, lack of effort on Trump's part uh, that that failed, although his total uh, disinterest in and lack of knowledge about health care probably did hurt. Um, I would just, as a personal matter, distance myself. Um, I'm not suggesting other people don't believe this from the idea that uh, January 6 was worth it. Uh, I, I, I would never see uh, that as a, a moral or reasonable way of, of judging it. Um, I, I think that it is possible, though, to say that January 6 was a national disgrace and that many of the things Trump did as president uh, were good. And I think really the the inability of many people, some on the right, some formerly on the right, some on the left, to distinguish between these things is one of the reasons our politics is so messed up. You know, it, it is simply not to endorse all of Donald Trump's uh, shortcomings uh, to, to say that, say, Amy Coney Barrett is a good judge. She is. Uh, that is true uh, independently of Trump. And um, I hope that at some point we'll be able to go back to a politics in which that man is not at the center of everything we uh, we believe. I, I heard the regret in your voice at the CPAC straw poll that he still ran away with 59 percent. Uh, DeSantis yeah. was the next closest, but it wasn't really close unless you took Trump out of it, in which case DeSantis was the heavy favorite. But his numbers, Trump's numbers went up this year versus last year. And so the Republican Party, they seem to miss him. Uh, how that will play out over the next year or so. We can only wait and watch and cover as reporters and commentators. Uh, okay, can I just ask you, because it's a bit of a weird turn, but I've got to ask you about the weirdest moment of last night, which was Nancy Pelosi. What was going on? As as Joe Biden was talking about the, uh, this was, wasn't this when he was talking about the burn pits that our servicemen may have been getting cancer from in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, she stood up to applaud. I don't know what's happening with her fist, but for the audience listening at home, she's got closed fists and she's kind of bouncing them together. And she looks, I mean, uh, as the kids would say, awkward AF. All right, here it is. One being stationed at bases, breathing in toxic smoke from burn pits. <laughs> Many of you have been there. Jeremy, would you like to take a shot at what's happening there? I don't know. I think one of the things that that people don't realize who haven't like been in the room during these state of the unions is uh, members of Congress have the speech there in front of them. Right. So they're reading along and who knows which maybe she read, skipped ahead a few lines to what he said next and was was anticipating that and and and, and got up a little too quickly. Just get um, back down then. Sip, sip, sip back down immediately. Yeah, it was it was it was hard to explain. It, no, there hasn't been worse clapping since uh, Nicole Kidman at the at that awards ceremony with her weird rings on that day. OK, uh, how long is the Biden sort of gaffe sought, Debbie? All right, let's play it. Here's Biden, a mashup of some weird moments. It may circle Kiev with tanks, but it'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. Time to see the the what used to be called the Rust Belt become the the the, the home of, of, of a significant resurgence of manufacturing. Bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Go get him. Now, Charles, I you write at National Review that you saw <clears throat> an oblivious, ignorant, overconfident blowhard last night. So I'm going to guess you didn't like it, and that you thought some of those moments were the reasons. But you tell me. Well, I think he's been that for a long time. Uh, the the thing that worries me about him is he can't speak. He can't read off a teleprompter. Uh, he clearly doesn't have the mental acuity anymore to digress even. You, you see him reaching for stories he's been telling for years, and he can't finish them because he can't remember them, and he can't incorporate them into what he's saying. And, and this isn't a one-off thing. I, you know, I'm notoriously soft on politicians who make mistakes. I was always the guy at National Review saying the 57 states thing didn't matter. Uh, corpsmen didn't matter. It doesn't matter if a president or a politician who travels all the time says hello Detroit 
when he's in Indianapolis. But Biden does it every 30 seconds. And I think that should matter. Uh, I think that should matter, uh, especially in the sort of international crisis that we're in now. Indeed. I want to remind the audience that Jeremy's book is called Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and Got Everything They Ever Wanted. Thanks to both of you for being here. Don't go away. Matt Welsh is back next, along with someone you're going to love. Inflation is out of control. And one area we see it more than ever is in the grocery store. Even though grocery prices feel like they doubled, good ranchers' prices have stayed low and affordable. Once you subscribe, your price never goes up. Your best price is locked in for life. They sell 100% American meat, American meat, and they deliver it to your door for a great price. You see, the problem with a lot of this beef is 85% of the grass-fed beef in stores and online is imported. You don't know where you're getting it from. You shop Good Ranchers for all of your beef, your chicken, and your seafood needs. Their beef is prime and upper choice, the two highest grades possible. They sell amazing and delicious steaks like ribeyes, T-bones, New York strips, and more. You get steakhouse quality at home with Good Ranchers. Aren't you sick of those grocery store prices? I am. Good Ranchers takes the guesswork out of the meat aisle. Having them in your fridge makes mealtime easy, convenient, less stressful, and less expensive. Plus, their packaging makes it easy to cook what you want and save the rest, which keeps you from wasting anything. Their animals are ethically raised and sustainably sourced. And they do things the right way, and it shows in every box. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, for $30 off and free express shipping. That's GoodRanchers.com slash M-E-G-Y-N. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. And if you don't buy the meat in your house, tell the person who does to check out Good Ranchers. Welcome back to The Megan Kelly Show. Joining me now, Nancy Rommelman and Matt Welsh. Nancy is an author, journalist, and co-founder of Paloma Media. And Matt is co-host of The Fifth Column Podcast, which is awesome, and veteran guest of The Megan Kelly Show. You're a veteran, Matt. Great to have you both with me. Arn Putin. Hey, Megan. Thanks, Megan. I like, I like it. You can show Nancy the ropes. This is what we That's do right. when she does this. He's uh, okay. me today. <laughs> Good. Okay. So let's start with uh, the news of the day, and I'd love to get your reactions to last night's State of the Union. Matt, thoughts? I... Uh, yeah, um, I, I, you know, it was a great 10 minute speech and a really bad 50 minute of follow up <laughs> to that speech. Um, uh, I'd like the Ukraine stuff. I think he spelled out uh, explicitly and correctly that the U.S. is not going to get involved militarily in this fight and with Russia, which is, I think, what you should do. And also that the NATO alliance uh, will be defended within every inch of territory. Both of those things are what a U.S. president should do. Um, wasn't a little, little bit more queasy about we're just going to start seizing, uh, you know, random Russians property uh, right and left. My libertarian heart doesn't like that. So say, much. You're a libertarian. I'm like, get them. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I that, a, lot, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of That's people right. like that. But then the the whole laundry list at the end. I mean, he he pivoted from like uh, uniting all of us to saying, "Oh yeah," and the tax cut trickle down theory only benefited the one percent. It's like, what well, well, what are we doing here? It's it was very uh, it, it detracted from the seriousness of the first ten minutes to make the last fifty minutes be like a Bill Clinton speech from nineteen ninety nine. Mm, yeah, the misleading on the tax cut and the misleading on the protection that gun manufacturers have on their, you know, they're the only company, the only company that can't be sued. They can be sued. A hundred percent. They can be sued. If they manufacture yeah. a gun that misfires in a way that actually hurts a human. A hundred percent. You can sue them. You cannot sue them for violence done by some random criminal with their gun, because we've recognized that it's too attenuated a link. In any event, he says it all the time. And I guess his base loves it. What were your thoughts, Nancy, overall? Well, the first thought, I, I thought this every time I saw the State of the Union, I really wish they'd get rid of the uh, Soviet era clapping. It's just, it just <laughs> takes so long. Not speech. even Chuck Schumer? No, oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> I was like, what was that? What um, happened I mean, with him? He just got a, like ahead of the applause line. He stood, nobody else stood forever. <laughs> he kind of went, oh, oh, uh. Um, so number one, uh, number two, I agree with Matt. I mean, though I said, you know, at lunch earlier today, I'm like, look, dude, if, if Joe Biden can cure cancer, I will vote for <laughs> even the corpse of the man in 2024. <laughs> but it's just like, you're just throwing on all this stuff. And you know, I mean, he, 
he better than anyone. How long has he been in politics? He knows these things are not going to happen. So why? What's the point of listening to it again? So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, there were a few things I liked, but none of those were, were part of it. You liked funding How- the police. I did. I yes, did. you like the funding of the police. But can, can we talk about the moment where he tried to say that women women fell out of the workforce during uh, COVID because they didn't have child care? What? And and why do you think they didn't have child care? I don't know <laughs> what could have been happening at the same time. Where would kids mm. usually have been during mm. the day? Why, 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 yeah. was, why was child care necessary Monday through Friday yeah. during school yeah. hours? Uh, and and crazy. portraying portraying our sudden maskless moment, which I can't wait for the rest of Washington, D.C., like the schools to be able to also enjoy, in addition to the octogenarians breathing on each other in a closed <laughs> space. Um, but to celebrate that as like, you know, we won. Um, no, a lot of people didn't win no. um, that. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, he was being callous to those who died, but uh, but he's sort of taking credit for the policies of the last two years. And the policies in, in a, you know, especially towards people who have kids in schools, as Megan Kelly knows, mm-hmm. <laughs> with gritted teeth, uh, right. haven't been a, a, a winning thing for a lot of people, especially in places controlled by Democrats. Uh, it's and, been and, really and, two different pandemics. The attempt to sound like the voice of reason, you know, it's time given the progression and the way COVID is now, you know, the decrease in cases. I mean, OK, so here just we went back for fun to take a look at uh, okay. March of 2021, which is when uh, Texas lifted its mask mandate. OK, and the Democrats freaked out. Biden called it Neanderthal thinking. Fauci, you're inviting another surge. Beto, it's a death warrant. Gavin Newsom, absolutely reckless. Reckless. Guess what the daily average of cases was when that happened, when it was absolutely reckless and Neanderthal thinking. It was around 54,000. That was the daily average. Guess what it is now? Um, now that Biden thinks it's okay to take away the masks, a hundred thousand, almost double when he called it Neanderthal thinking. And why? So how does he get there? Well, he says, well, it's time to focus on the hospitalization rate instead of the case rate. Well, that's always been the case. You just refuse to to do it. Right. Right. Uh, Welcome to the party. So no acknowledgement. That's why I said they're they're, I know the term gets overused, but like they're gaslighting us. The uh, you know, David Leonhardt from The New York Times uh, is a, a classic case of someone who's, you know, he's writing for the New York Times audience, telling them very gently um, what those of us who are not working for the New York Times have been screaming about, uh, you know, a year to 18 months before. Like, hmm, maybe we don't really like when Saturday Night Live did its skit the other day of of people talking around and kind of oh, realizing we'll at a dinner party that uh, maybe all of these sort of mask policies and these things were more theatrical than a sciencical um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's infuriating. I'm happy to see it happen. Uh, my, my daughter, uh, Same. daughters are going to be able to take their masks off at school next week in New York city. Finally. Um, so I'm happy and I don't want to look to look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, but it is infuriating and Republicans are right to, in their response say, Hey, look, there's a parental revolt happening right now because you screwed with parents and you, and, uh, and you got in bed with the teachers unions in your making of policy, yes. which is absolutely true. Uh, Joe Biden literally goes to bed as he brags uh, in his speeches <laughs> with, the with the teachers union member, <laughs> member every night. It's so true. There's a lot in there. So David Leonhardt, I agree with you. I think he's a gift, though. He's been on this show, too. He's also a veteran. Um, and the reason he's so important is because he does speak to the audience that we most need to convince. I know we're angry at these people who imposed all this stuff on us, but like he is a voice they will listen to and they get mad at him. But he does keep yeah. reminding them of what the truths are. And I will say, even when he was on this program, we were talking about Omicron. It was at the beginning. And I was like, well, you know, it doesn't seem to be that serious once you get it. So, you know, what's the big freak out about? And he was like, well, if you look at how easily it's spread, it will result in a massive number of deaths if it spreads like this. And some of my audience wrote me and said, well, we don't like it. We don't hear from him. He's a he's an alarmist. Well, he was right. Exactly what he predicted would happen did happen. So to his credit, you know, he speaks truth no matter who the audience he's in front of. Um, and I, I appreciate that in a in a reporter left or right um but yeah can we talk about that saturday night live skit so people (laughs) may have missed it because they're not really watching saturday night live but it it was an unbelievable it was like two minutes long we won't play the whole thing but it was all these actors from snl out there pretending to be democrats well well, sure pretending what great acting (laughs) um and like 
try, starting to criticize what the Democrats did to us for all this time with these mandates and shutdowns and so on, and like questioning the orthodoxy a little. Here it is. Well, I heard the CDC is going to lift all mask mandates soon. Oh, yeah, I know. It's so weird. It's it's like COVID's not over, but it's just going to stop. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Oh, you know, that reminds me of this article I read. Oh, honey, where... no one wants to hear about that. <laughs> well, it was in Bloomberg, and I thought it was interesting. What, uh, what article? Well, it Honey. Was... <laughs> it was just saying how mask mandates had, I don't know, little to no effect on COVID. <laughs> Cue the shocked looks. <laughs> the nervous water pouring. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not like I'm anti-mask or anything. I just sometimes wonder if any of the things we did actually helped. I went to a child's birthday party, self-careful, and they did gymnastics in masks don't and then they went into another room and took off their masks to eat pizza this is the end of me so did they really need the mask or oh, no did any of us ever need the mask no oh my gosh it's you want to laugh but also i want to punch them in the face <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Nancy's been leading a, a one woman crew to uh, take masks off people's faces since about June 2020. Uh, oh, yeah. my sister from that. another mister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started having people over for lunch in June 2020. And everyone's like, wait, what? What do you mean? I was like, no, dude, just come. Just lunch. We're not going to French kiss. We'll just have like two <laughs> people. And everybody like crept out of their houses. I was like, it's OK. And it has been OK. So the skit was pretty funny. It was kind of they had one a couple of years ago based on uh, Me Too, which I actually thought was even funnier than mm. this one. But it is kind of amazing to me as someone who has not been of that ilk to think that people really, really, really believe what they're doing. Like they really believe they are right yeah. in having the masks on this time. I mean, do you is that really possible? I think there's yeah. a there's a signaling exercise with it that's pretty explicit. And we've seen this in school policies too, right? Like um, people were afraid to up until basically election day 2020 in blue states express out loud too much that they were against school closures because, and they, this is on the record, lots of people said that they didn't want to be perceived as Trump supporters, right? right um, they right, didn't want to be right. as Trumpy. My daughter uh, my, who goes to middle school in Brooklyn at the nice white parent school, I, I should uh, <laughs> hesitate to add. Um, uh, she uh, used to be a mask kind of fanatic, but then she's now been kind of the leading, put it on the chin or take it off altogether. And she's immediately called Trumpy uh, by her classmates in a place where there might be. A, yeah, my, you know, my daughter, that's not likely, um, but uh, in a place that probably voted 103 uh, percent for Joe Biden this last time. So there's a there's a, a sense of uh, and you saw this in Portland, right, where Nancy's done a lot of great reporting of of people wearing a mask to signal their like a, a sort of solidarity and their political uh, point oh, of view more 100%. than that they grappled with any oh, science. There, we had Jennifer Say on the program, uh, uh, and I, I want to oh, yeah. hear about Portland one second, but we had Jennifer Say on the program, who is the um, head of Levi's, and she got forced out because what was her sin? Was she out there parading against, you know, with the truckers against the vax mandates? No. Was she even parading against the mask mandates? No. She wanted the schools to be open. In San Francisco, which now we've seen, and I, wow. I want to get to this too. She she wanted those school board members recalled. She wanted the schools to be open, and they called that Trumpy within Levi's, supposed to be America's brand. Guess again, consider Wrangler, everyone. Um, and she <laughs> wound up fired. She wound up fired for that absurdity. Go ahead, Nance. Well, I was just gonna. I was gonna say I, I just spoke with someone from Portland two days ago who said that uh, you know Portlanders keep their masks on because they want to signal that they care. They care more than old people. They care about old people and and whoever might be more vulnerable. And even now, even now that it's being lifted everywhere, they're not lifting it yet. 
in 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 Portland. Uh, in terms of the recall, uh, was, we both were at. We were both at the recall party. Uh, we were at the recall watch party, and it was like oh. being inside an Alka Seltzer. It was so <laughs> exciting. You could tell, like, there was no way that. They, these people were not going to be recalled and they were and they were slaughtered. They were slaughtered. And it was really, yeah. really nice to see. And I think I am going to go back and cover the uh, the Chesa Boudin recall because oh I God. think there is. Yeah, so the Chesa <laughs> the Chesa Boudin thing is blowing my mind. My, my audience knows I'm now obsessed with Chesa Boudin. I mean, people don't oh. know, but but like he th- this is the man. This is the son of two convicted murderous terrorists of domestic mm-hmm. terrorists who was raised mm-hmm. by two other Murderous okay. terrorists. Four for four. Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. Ber- Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. I mean, Bill, the head of the Weather Underground, which bombed several buildings. They actually yeah. did blow up a building, including themselves, not Bill and his wife, but their group and so on. That's his parents and then his adoptive parents. No wonder the guy does not want to fight crime. And now he's gotten all his bad press for the murder rate in San Francisco and the crime rate and the, the carjackings and the car thefts and so on. And unlike London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, who's like, oh shit i'm gonna pivot on this i'm pivoting um he's like more prosecution does not does not stop crime i'm telling you you guys need to listen to me what i am doing is working he is going to be recalled yes yes he's going to be recalled i'm in touch with some people that are leading the recall there and they are adamant i think i think the wave is with them, I think, especially after the slaughter of the school board members. And when you look at what these people have done, like item by item, it's it's unbelievable. I think he will be recalled. I think we might be seeing a little sea change in uh, San Francisco. We'll see. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a po- there's a political uh, sea change, too. Uh, you can see it in the personage of uh, Eric Adams in New York. I mean, yep. there's a big city backlash against over progressive policies. Some of that stuff is going to lead to places that makes me uncomfortable. Um, I think that uh, in addition to Chase Boudin being a clown and in way over his head, um, that people not just in San Francisco, but in New York are um, they're pinning they're pinning those policies for things that may or may not have something to do directly to the things that they're mad about. Um, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, it's kind of, it's, uh, it, and they're going to th- perhaps throw out some, uh, what I would consider to be uh, good policies about cash bail, for example, not to say that you let people go who are I'm against you again. It's that, you, it's, a, it's that if you've, this is your 12th time, yeah. you know, and you're violent, uh, that's a, a different thing altogether. Uh, but you're seeing a, a real backlash. Uh, and I think, um, you know, you can even bring it back to CDC masking policies and the fact that we somehow took the masks off last night in Washington. It's amazing how the science seems to be impacted by what happens at the ballot box, beginning with Glenn Youngkin in Virginia and then going on to well, uh, and, the and literally, Rico. literally one day, I think it was after uh, this Democrat polling group came out with a red alarm fire notice to the Dems saying you will lose. Stop being such downers on covid the american people are over it they want to live with it they do not want to be reminded of restrictions or any of this stuff. just stop it stop it and suddenly ah, oh, 102,000 <laughs> cases is no longer a problem when you know 54,000 was death destruction you can't you don't care about people yeah I, yeah again it's really hard not to uh grit your teeth at this, uh, given, uh, you know, everything that every single person, including people who are not like us, we are public figures. I understand, Megan, that you can criticize a time or two in your public uh, career. Um, <laughs> it's uh, happened to been known to happen. <laughs> I have two, maybe to a lesser extent, um, uh, but that's fine. It's part of our job description, but it's not part of the job description of just parents who are going to school board meetings and saying, hey, how come the schools aren't open? And they were uh, brutalized by teachers unions, by uh, by politicians. Um, Richard Carranza, the school board chief in New York, uh, until he uh, he fled uh, about a year ago, um, they would just call those people racist. And it was it's an incredible discouragement to public participation. One of the interesting things about the San Francisco recall, the co-organizers of it. Who are really great uh, people, mm-hmm. one of whom is an immigrant from India and the other whom is a, a, a woman progressive uh, from but Caltech. Uh, and they just didn't give a rat's patootie about being called a racist. And in fact, they saw what they did. And that was the number one thing that they would be hit with in San Francisco. <laughs> We're going to hit the Democrats by calling them racist. What? Um, Why would like they live they here? Wanted, they wanted to make the uh, discourse safe 
for people and have people be brave and and say yeah. when you are called that laugh at the person say that's just not true and then just move on immediately um and that uh, part of the alka seltzer in the room is that you could see there's a galvanizing effect on people who are no longer discouraged from public participation by this kind of freighted name calling so it's can i say this is this is yeah. one of the very very rare disagreements i have with the brilliant douglas murray i mean he's just such a smart social commentator um and his book the madness of crowds is just well worth your time but he um he he really feels strongly that if somebody hurls the r word at you you should respond indignantly you know you should be like how dare you how dare you use that word against me how dare you water it down in this way how do you, you know like but and i am like that may have been true three years ago five years ago. but like they hurl around so much now i mean truly i think you're right the only response is to laugh and move on like okay i got it i'm racist then i'm racist okay got it let's move on because they've used it against everyone black people white people Republicans, Democrats, doesn't matter. What? I mean, someone can say to me, you know, you are a seven foot tall left handed Croatian tennis player. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with me. And they could call me racist. Like, it it doesn't have anything to do with me. Let's move on. It's just it just doesn't have any power. And it's a shame because bigotry is bad. Okay, you know, like uh, making collective demonizations of populations based on stuff that they didn't choose or even sometimes stuff that they do choose, like their politics. Uh, But to say that an entire large class, millions of people are uh, you know, uh, deplorable or beyond the pale in some way or or inferior in some way. That's awful. And we need a language to describe that. And that language has been so abused. And, and the, the threshold uh, of, of, of evidence for it has been so incredibly lowered, especially mm-hmm. in within journalism over the last five, six years, um, that uh, th- that it's kind of robbed us of the language to call things by their proper names. And that's a that's a damn dirty shame because yeah. racism sucks and we shouldn't tolerate it. Xenophobia sucks. You know, when when Donald Trump said that, you know, the judge Curiel, for whatever his name was in uh, 2016, Curiel, yeah. um, said that uh, that we can't trust him to make a judgment in a case because of his background. That was terrible. You that should never do that. And you should have a language to describe that. That that was one of the things um that I hit Trump for. It was actually Trump, you know, he had attacked me and then we kind of made up and then, you know, I continued to hit him uh, when he deserved it. And I can fit t- continue to this day to defend him when he deserves it. That's like a, what a real, what an honest journalist slash commentator should do. If somebody's uniformly defending one side or so on, then you're, you know, you should understand what you're getting, which is somebody who's partisan, not objective. But that was clearly beyond the pale and was a nonsense objection to Judge Curiel. Anyway, yes, we need that. Ra- we need that word. We need the word racist to work, but it doesn't anymore. They've completely diluted it past the point of its uh, it being effective. And I think to your point, Nancy, like the people who spoke up at that school board meeting, they they got it. And I give them credit for being Democrats and getting it. Uh, I think we actually have a clip. This is your clip. This is from your video. You were there of one of the parents um, there talking about how the school board needs to think about educating the kids and not just renaming schools while this while the education is shut down. Here he is. And we want to see school board members who put education first. Yeah. yeah. and who put the needs of the most disadvantaged kids first, who have been the ones who've fallen the furthest behind right. in the two and a half, two years That's that right. the school has been shut, and who've lost the most in this pandemic. And who the school board, who is, who, which talks about social justice nonstop, has not prioritized. Mm-hmm. It is not progressive to send back the kids who are the most disadvantaged to not prioritize their education. It is not progressive. And San Francisco today has shown us what it means to be progressive. Yeah, I like that guy. Oh, man, he was great. Boy, his voice, when he gets at volume, yeah. boy, he was, woo! Doesn't need a microphone. Yeah, he was one of the, the main organizers, he and, and his partner. And they were accused, you know, we actually went to their apartment. They live in kind of like a, a big rambling apartment with five in kids hate. in the hate. And they were accused of being part of the billionaire class. It was like, yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> nice, really. nice try. Yeah, that's they'll get you on something. If, if they can't get you on racism, you know, because yeah. you, you happen to be have brown skin, they'll they'll try anyway. They, they don't care. They'll try anything. All right. So there's a lot more to talk about, including D- Nancy's 
significant time with a bunch of serial killers. So, oh. so we're, we're going to get to that <laughs> um, and much more right after this quick, quick break. So I would be remiss if I moved on to serial killers without talking first about um, another notable performance last night or yesterday. And that is uh, the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, who well before the events of last night gave an interview earlier in the day to a radio station in St. Louis that has been universally mocked. I mean, it was mocked by the left and the right all over Twitter yesterday. And take one listen and you tell me why. Ukraine is a country in Europe. It exists next to another country called Russia. Russia is a bigger country. Russia is a powerful country. Russia decided to invade a smaller country called Ukraine. So basically that's wrong. Sharing is caring. Now, I will say he asked her to d- explain it in layman's terms or simple yes. terms. Okay. Uh, are okay. the uh, like are the is St. Louis now just a, suddenly a bunch of kindergartners? Did all the grownups leave the city? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, was that to a second grade that she was speaking? To? I mean, at least it's better than that. Uh, that uh, thing that she said about six weeks ago when uh, someone uh, was asking her about um, COVID policy and. And, you know, whether they got tests wrong or whether they did, did bad things. And 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 uh, and she said something to the effect of every day is the day to start doing the things that are better. And that's why we are going to be doing that. Isn't which that, the, that was like the old total today. serial commercial, I think. Right. It's today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> before we leave the State of the Union, I'd like to give one. I, there was one thing for me that was surprising and positive is when he started talking about policing, which is something that I've covered a lot mm-hmm. since I covered the protests in Portland and then the murders on, in the NYPD here. And just in general, I've talked a lot about policing. When he started talking about it, I was terrified, Megan. I was like, oh, my God, he's going to be like, we got to start defunding and we have to like have neighborhood groups doing this instead. And when he said we have to fund the police and he, I think he said it three times, I was heartened to hear that. You know, Even we talked about this in our first with our first panel. And I mean, yes, he said the right words, but he's not really the problem. It's Democrats across the country who are the problem. I agree. But I think we saw in the run up to the election that he was I, I don't want to use the word pandering, but he was listening quite a lot to the really, really more progressive wings of the of the Democratic Party. He did try to hedge a little bit more. You're right. He did. He was hedging on this issue a bit more. Yeah. So. Let's see. You're you're applauding the end of the hedging. Uh, I I would applaud the end of the discussion altogether. As long as he um, legalizes weed. Megan, yeah. <laughs> Look, my feeling is, and, and I know, like it's he's easy to make fun of. So is Kamala, but and so is Trump. But th- people died as a result of these crazy policies, the defund the police yeah. policies that yes. were pushed on city after city. People died, and and you know who died more than anybody? African American people. Um, because right. it was their neighborhoods that lost police presence and needed them most in too many big cities. And so where do those people who unnecessarily lost loved ones go for their apology now, now that Biden's pretending like he and his party have been against this all along and, you know, they're the voice of reason. Nonsense. They are the reason this happened. And it's yet another thing to hold them accountable for. I'm glad he's changing his messaging. Go talk to Cory Bush. Talk to Ilan Omar. Talk to AOC, who is, you know, we, one of our, our first guests was talking about how, yes, it, you know, Mayor de Blasio said he was going to defund the, the police by uh, $100 million in New York City. But Eric Adams hasn't changed the budget for this year, but they already took the money away. You know, I mean, like real people have suffered as a result of these decisions. And that's what elections are for. Um that, that thing with the cops was so awful, Nancy. And I don't think the New Yorkers are soon to forget it. Uh, in Portland, where they have as acrimonious a relationship with their police department as any city in the country, they are on target now to have 30 percent more murders this year than last year. And last year was a bit of a record, not the record, the 80s. It was larger. But um, you, 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 you can't look at what's going on in cities in terms of violent crime and then say, you know, really what what we really should do is keep do- going down the road where we're taking more money from the force and having a more acrimonious relationship with the police department. It's got to stop. Mm-hmm. And you see the cops like I'll see cops out there who listen to the show or know me and they're so grateful they're just so yeah. grateful that there's anyone out there defending them at all. They don't need just a defense. It's just, I don't 
quote, defend the police, I offer facts. These are the facts. I counter non-factual narratives with truth. And for that, they're so grateful because people within the Democrat Party are the ones spinning lies that have endangered and cost lives. Uh, and they they can't get away with just defund the police. No, what do you mean? We're going to we're going to fund the police. That's us. And Joe Biden's been trying to play that for a while with like, remember, he had he claimed his uh, American Rescue Plan, which was the covid relief, you know, that he was trying to fund the police with three hundred million dollars in that. And that was like his attempt to fund him because the police, the Republicans wouldn't support his whole wish list of stuff. They were against de- whatever. It's all political maneuvering. OK, let's talk about serial killers. Um <laughs> Matt's like, yes, yes, I've been waiting for this. Um, why are you spending so much time with them? Well, okay. <laughs> and what have you learned? It's not so many serial killers. I did interview uh, John Wayne Gacy before, about a week and a half before his execution, because I had an opportunity to drive cross country with one of his pen pals and uh, and interview the guy. And, and nobody really had done that. It had been very... Uh, I think one journalist from The New Yorker had, and it was kind of a mingy piece, sorry, writer for The New Yorker. Uh, (laughs) And so I did that. Um, I have written about, I've written about a Munchausen by proxy mom who killed herself and her daughter. And then a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called uh, To the Bridge, A True Story of Motherhood and Murder. Great book. Thank you, Matt. Um, That uh, a woman uh, in Portland threw her two young kids off a bridge in Selwood, uh, the Selwood Bridge in Portland, Oregon, and the little four-year-old died and the the seven-year-old survived. She actually saved her own life. She screamed and screamed until she was rescued by some good Samaritans. It's not that I'm like fascinated with murder. It's just that sometimes these stories get told. And they're told in a way where people are incurious because they're scary. And I always think it's a little better to really look at things and unpack it and sort of understand it. And um, I, that's what I do. I get fascinated and I go looking and I write the story. So so when you walk into I've, I've walked into jails before and sat with criminal defendants, sure. people accused of murder. There's a, like a, one of the greatest stories of my legal career involves such a such a moment. I'll tell you tell it quickly. Uh, I was very young. I was interning for a criminal defense attorney out in Syracuse, New York, where uh, I wasn't actually yet even in law school. I was just, this was a, do you really want to be a lawyer type internship? And believe it or not, I went on to become a lawyer after this story. But anyway, um, I taught aerobics at the time. And so my boss said, we got to go to the prison on Saturday. And I was like, well, I got to teach this class in the morning. And he said, that's fine. Just meet me at the office after you're done and we will we'll go. I said, fine. Well, something happened on his end and he wasn't able to meet me at the office. And without understanding that I didn't have my business outfit at the spa, at oh. the at the gym, he came by the gym to pick me up and we were going to go directly to the jail, maximum security prison. And I didn't, you know, I was planning on going home and then going to the office and changing, but it didn't, didn't work out. So, I mean, now it was, I was in college for between 88 and 92. Okay. So this is, I guess, whatever, 91 probably. And you know, the aerobics of the time, <laughs> It was very spandexy. It was very neony. It was yeah. very tight. It was very revealing. What I had Pick on was a or it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I had on a one piece black leotard, of course, skin tight because it was like raw, you know, skin tight, with a Hair. neon orange thong, neon orange thong on the back of it. Right, my bottom was covered because it was black, but you know, that's, that was the look with neon orange sh- slouch socks. Because that was, of course, mm-hmm. and a neon orange scrunchie with my big over teased hair sticking. And I, that's how I, and so we show up to the prison and the guards, the, you have to, I had a winter coat on it, thank God, because at least it was Syracuse, you know, you always have to have a winter coat. And the guards, you can't take your coat in when you go visit the prisoners yeah. at the maximum security. Yeah. You have to take the coat. They made that rule up. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> truly i'm like oh my god what the fuck is going on here so we're we're going and they're like she's got to take the coat off and and my boss looks at the guards and he looks at me and he goes sh- sh- show them your little outfit <laughs> so i like open the coat and they're like the coat stays on she keeps the coat <laughs> <laughs> they did not make me go in to see the murder defendant in that outfit but trauma trauma i get it i need a trigger warning when you talk about going to the prisons you just reminded me of something that i forgot so when i went to go see gacy you know you check in and i was not wearing spandex but i was like 30 years old and you know whatever looked okay so he was up of course he was on death row so he was up uh we went and visited and there was not like there was no plexiglass or anything i was sitting at a table with the guy like three feet between us his hands were shackled but going up to see him 
we had to kind of go up this long curvy staircase and prisoners could see us from other windows. Oh boy. And all oh, of boy. a sudden I started hearing this like, wah, wah, wah. Oh. It was just a cyclone of men because it was a woman and like, you know, they don't get to see women. It's just like, hi. Huh. Anyway. Yeah. The, then you're wondering like, is this skirt long enough? Is this like yeah. going up yeah. the stairs? Is it short enough? Is it short enough? How, is it short enough? <laughs> Matt, Matt's going a different direction. So what, I mean, weird, weird question, but everybody wants to know, what was, what was John Wayne Gacy like? What was it like to be across from him? You know, I've said this a lot. He was kind of like, kind of old and fat and like super cheerful. Hey, Megan, how you doing? How's your family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I like that show too. Hey, hey, guards, get this lady a cheeseburger. So tell me, Megan, like, tell me, like, you can tell me about your sex life. It's fine though. You can tell me. He was super, super loquacious, absolutely hungry for communication, but it was the John Wayne Gacy story. It does show. It was like he was on stage and I got to tell you, it was exhausting. Was it scary? You know, you're sitting in the maximum security there. There's guards right there. They're armed. His hands, like he's not going to do anything to you. But, you know, you do learn when you leave that someone that looks just this sort of like your fat Uncle Johnny actually has killed at least 33 and not just killed, but killed and tortured uh, and raped 33 young men and boys. So oh that's God. kind of an eye opener. Um, if people want to read about it, it's on Amazon. Then go buy it. So OK. Gosh, that's like this is so disturbing. And I know, you, yeah, you've written about how it, it's sort of bizarre to be across from somebody like that who's clearly a psychopath mm -hmm. and yet wants to charm you. Like, what's going yeah. on? Absolutely. But that's that's, you know, the, the, these these sorts of charming sociopaths. They have this terrible and terrific trait of making you believe that they really like you and you have a lot in common. And that's why people that's why people fall for them. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible talent. And people have asked me, like, do you think that he understood right from wrong? I'm like, oh, I'm sure he does. But what what we don't understand is that we're not allowed to do those things. But he's so much smarter than the rest of us that he's allowed to do those things. That was what mm -hmm. I came away. Uh, OK, let's um, sorry to ignore you, Matt, but there's a lot of interesting stuff to go on. <laughs> so just sit there. Um, OK, um, let's talk about the Me Too dust up that you got into, which I find fascinating. So when the Me Too movement was happening, you saw an opportunity to offer a different point of view. Like, all right, something else could be going on with some of these accusers, some of these women, not everybody, but some of them. And it's worth probing and it's worth providing due process um, for, for those who get accused. And you, the, you got the shitstorm raining down upon you and your husband and his business because that was, I, I guess I will be charitable to the people who came after you and say that was the bomb throwing phase of that revolution. And they were taking down anyone who had the temerity to question the believe all women narrative. Something I do think we're now over. I do. I do. It's a different time right now. We're also a different city. This was in Portland, Oregon. You know, had this happened, it was a former angry employee of my husband's. You know, if 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 she had gone with her information to the press and she lived in New York City where there are 5,000 restaurants and, you know, 150,000 employees, it would have been a non-story. But in Portland, it was a story and it was a story um, they wanted to hear. They wanted to have confirmed that they were correct. And anybody that spoke with some nuance, I mean, our, our first story that I did was talking about like, you know, is Asha Argento really the best face of Me Too? Like, I, I don't really think so. Asia um, Argento. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah was, who had been had been accused of statutory rape and they'd been paying off the the boy, her, her late boyfriend, Anthony Bourdain had. And it was, you know, it was an interesting story. And yet she's out there with Rose McGowan. I am the face of Me Too. And, you know, I, I thought that was probably a pretty poor choice. Um, but, you know, I was writing about this yesterday and we were talking earlier about these words, right? Misogynist, racist, transphobe. And I was writing yesterday that it's sort of like people take these shortcuts, right? They take their sh the shortcut to the destination they want, whether it's a destination that they want a better future for the world or they take a destination that they want to look heroic for bringing somebody down. It's like a game of shoots and ladders. You know, you can go all the way around the board. Oh, or you can find this one, you know, ladder that springs you uh, up like really fast uh, because I'm going to, you know, call Nancy Rommelman a misogynist and then I will look like a hero for rape for, apologist. For, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. A rape apologist. I mean, it's oh, just sure. you know, it's it, right. Yeah, it's bananas. But you know what? It works or it used to work. But 
people do, you know, we, we spoke earlier about this. You're just like, that has nothing to do with me. But at the time, you're completely right, Megan. At that time, you know, this was just, you just set fire to this stuff and it burns up. And it, it was it was extremely devastating. I should take mm-hmm. uh, uh, some of the blame for it because I came up with the name of, of their little YouTube, uh, whatever, uh, uh, video podcast, of which there's five episodes from what I What was it again? It was like, not me or what was it? Me neither. Hashtag me, me neither. neither. I mean, it's a good name, but it's also like it's hit Matt, me. It's Matt's fault. Uh, it's it's my fault. <laughs> Everything uh, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what do you uh, think? I, like, I'm curious now because I do think you know we're we're definitely in a very different place in the Me Too movement, yeah, and with sure. you know all these states investigating Black Lives Matter for its fraud and for pocketing sure. the money and the donations, and you know we, we started off talking about how it they're the ones who pushed defund the police more than anyone, which is now I mean all the way up to the president of the United States, the Democratic president in the United States being dismissed and disagreed with. Do you feel like what's happened with that sort of racial reckoning, the overcorrection, not just actually taking a hard look at whether, you know, we, we see racism in this institution or that, but like the craziness, you know, the insanity of like all the black students get free tutoring and nobody else does. And, you know, like just this sort of all the white people have to res- resign from their jobs so that black people can have those roles like the guy from Reddit. Um, do you feel like that phase is over, too? I don't. I keep I keep waiting for the the corner to be turned um, decisively. We were not in the mania that we were at the height of the George Floyd protests and afterwards, by which I don't actually refer to the George Floyd protests themselves, but like the media reaction. There is a guy, the director of a museum in San Francisco had to resign for like saying something completely uh, uh, innocuous, a poetry magazine. Right. Yeah, it was supportive. supportive of BLM, but not not enough. And then it's like, yeah, well, you're past racism. You should shut up. Uh, the Poetry Foundation in Chicago, like completely imploded. There's like knitting groups, <laughs> uh, like a terrible, terrible fratricide with the knitting groups happening. <laughs> We're not exactly in that freak out that was there that summer that like, caused a lot of uh, implosion in the media. And that's good. But. The trend lines, the stories keep happening. I mean, uh, John McWhorter wrote about a, a, piece, a story just like that uh, today in the New York Times. Um, it keeps with us. I'm afraid that the, um, the there's an institutionalization of this, of uh, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, training and departments at universities and things like that. They need something to do. Right. Um, yeah. It's like mm-hmm. you, you see this in some of the coverage. There was a a piece, uh, I think it was CBS News, and I'm sorry if it wasn't, um, but out of Ukraine, which is a Ukraine's a really interesting place right now. A lot of news happening that you could write about. And it was about what would happen, you know, the, the experience of one uh, trans uh, Ukrainian. Yes, um, we're on the same page. Uh, I mentioned this in the A block. Yes, it's and, absurd. And, who, who cares about that right a- now? It is a story, every individual, you know, dignity and story. But like you could see that there's these desks that exist at media institutions and they need to come up with stories. Um, and there are departments within and, and human resources departments. My God, uh, the amount of which this has been institutionalized. So I'm afraid that we're going to keep seeing this over and over again. And we have this whole generation of people who've just been compiling social media uh, that can be mined by uh you know uh, outrage archaeologists so i would like to think that we turn the corner and i and i really hope so um uh and the more that we laugh and just call bs right in in its face the better uh the the quicker we'll get to a a different place but i think it's going to be a while before the legacy. What you said reminded me of something that Joe Biden actually said on defund the police. He, at the time when he was candidate Biden, he was asked about this, right? It was in the height of the post George Floyd time and he hadn't yet been elected. And he was asked where you stand on defund the police. And he said, oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm for, um, you know, reform, police reform and funding the police so long as they have the requisite number of diversity hires. So the police department, you know, in Butte, Montana, where our our guest on Monday was from, which has very low in in black population, they need to have 50 percent black police in order for Joe Biden's view, in his view, for them to get their funding. Right. Like he needs perfect parity between blacks and whites. That's what he was saying when he was running. And not only that, at, on his first day or second day in office, he signed a, a whole of government executive uh, order to 
install an equity lens by which they will measure all of their output and inputs and hiring and everything else. Um, I know people work in the federal government. It's changed the way that they do their work because they're fulfilling this basically HR request, but also sort of a, a measurement impact request as well. That you have to show some work at the end of that. So he has been very receptive to this notion, but it is interesting as uh, my uh, fifth column co-host Camille Foster pointed out on Twitter yesterday, the word equity didn't show up in, in that, in that speech. This was mm. not the most woke speech from a democratic president that we've seen in a long time. If anything, wow. it was kind of closer to the opposite. Back to the, no, so this is a separate memo that went out to the Dems about two weeks ago from the DCCC. They had done their own research and they said, voters find us preachy, judgmental, and insufferable. And we have to stop with the culture war stuff because we're losing. Right? So it's like, they're finally getting the memo. I feel like, I feel vindicated because everything we've been saying is right, has been proven right. And we're not only right with the Republican voters, we're right with the Democrat voters. I've been saying this all along that I've been saying to my Republican friends, do not divide our army because when it comes to fighting this woke cultural rot, the the left is with us. It's the far left wokesters who are against us. And I even don't even want to say far left because Crystal Ball, she once said, like, I'm kind of far left, but she's not woke. It's those it's the woke warriors who have nothing to do but create problems for people. Like you say, that uh, uh, what is it? What al- archaeologists, the, on- the online archaeologists, outrage, archa- outrage yeah. archa- those people. Those are the ones who have been the enemy of normal, reasonable people, black, white, left, right. And they're losing. There's the the thing that the the people don't realize, I think, is when that wave comes to them. I mean, most people don't really necessarily identify with, quote unquote, cancel culture stories or whatever, uh, as long as it doesn't like directly encroach on them. This is why the parent revolt is so significant, because, you know, there's 50 million plus kids in public schools. A lot of parents out there, when they see these policies affect their lives, their kids lives, They've got a lot of skin in the game and suddenly they're noticing a lot more things. This is also true with just normal, you know, or not normal, abnormal kind of uh, uh, woke related type of things, the DEI uh, uh, struggle sessions at your work. When that comes into your workplace and, I, and I've and gotten hundreds of emails from people, uh, you know, people in their own company, they started their own company, were sit, sat down and subject to these kind of cross examinations. They go, hold on a second. This is now where I live and the stuff. Um, seems so crazy. The San Francisco school board, like the way that they conducted themselves, the language with which they they talked about their own work is so crazy sounding to normal people um, that as soon as it hits normal people, uh, either at their workplace or with their kids or something else like that, there is going to be a huge backlash because it's going to be seen like an alien came down and started uh, spouting all this gibberish at them. Uh, this is a, a tremendous uh, threat, I think, to Democrats going forward. And yeah. you're going to see a lot of people back backpedaling furiously. Well, I'll end it with uh, another quote of Douglas Murray, the great and the one and only Douglas Murray, who, you know, he says, when your employer comes to you and tells you that you must participate in a session like that, you should say, I refuse. I refuse to let you re-racialize my country, my company, and myself. I love it. He's brilliant. Always worth listening to, as are you two. Nancy, Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Megan. Bye. All right. All the best. Don't forget to watch tomorrow because we've got Buck Sexton and Jason Whitlock. Check us out on YouTube in the meantime, and we'll see you tomorrow.